Welcome to worship. We are so glad to be together. Let us begin with our call to worship. Our God is gracious. Our God, our God is, is merciful. still merciful. Our Lord doesn't easily anger. But abounds in love and mercy. God is ready to relent from punishing. Let us praise our God. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneels at the feet of his friends, silently washes their feet. Master who acts as a slave to them. Yesu, Yesu. Fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Neighbors are wealthy and poor, varied in color and race. Neighbors are nearby and far away. Yesu, Yesu. Fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. These are the ones we will serve, these are the ones we will love. All these are neighbors to us and you. Yesu, Yesu. Fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. You at the feet of our friends, silently washing their feet. This is the way we will live with you. Yesu, Yesu. Fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. We confess our sins before God and one another. God of the covenant, you have, you have never, never failed, failed in, in your, your promises, promises to, to us, but we, we often fail to be your faithful people. people. We waste our time and resources on things which do not give life. We doubt our abilities and hide our light away from the world. We flee from your call when it doesn't appeal to us. Forgive us and call us back to your sustaining love. Dear friends, God hears us when we repent and is quick to pardon our failures. Hear the words of your forgiveness and believe that you have been restored by your creator's great mercy and compassion. Rejoice. Amen. Amen. And let us pray together the prayer of the day. Gracious God, you, you show, show abundant, abundant mercy, mercy even, even when we, we cannot see the purpose of it. Of it. Give, Give us your heart for compassion and love for all your children, regardless of who or where they may be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, kids. I hope you're having a great day wherever you're at. Hey, I got a question for you. Have you ever been asked to do something that you just didn't want to do? You know, maybe you've been asked to, to finish your vegetables and you sat at the table and went, no, 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 no. Or you were asked to go take the trash out, and you went, ah, I think I'll let somebody else do it. You know, we, we get asked to do some things, and we just don't feel like doing it. Well, today we've got a story in our Bible that is about a guy who just doesn't feel like doing what God wants. Can you imagine not doing what God wants? Well, he's got a very famous name, and I, when I say his name, I know what you're going to think of right away. So, his name is Jonah. And I know, I know, you're thinking about the whale. And the whale is a big part of the Jonah story, sort of. But really, the Jonah story is about a guy named Jonah who doesn't want to go 
to a group of people called the Ninevites. They live in Nineveh. He doesn't want to go there, and he doesn't want them to be changed by God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine not wanting somebody to change and follow God? Well, that's kind of Jonah's issue. Jonah struggles with it because he, he, he isn't very happy with the people of Nineveh. So, instead of doing what God asked, Jonah runs the other way. Jonah takes off and he goes to the, to the water, to the beach. And he gets in a fishing boat with a bunch of fishermen. And he tries to get away from God. But God doesn't get, let Jonah get away. Jo God stays with Jonah. And even when Jonah ends up in the whale and ends up coming out of the whale, you know, in kind of a gross way, we won't talk about that. But even after that, Jonah goes to the people of Nineveh and he's not really all that excited about what he has to do. But God is excited about the people of Nineveh. God wants to see the people of Nineveh changed. And you know what happens? God's word coming out of the mouth of Jonah changes the people of Nineveh. They changes, and there's over 120,000 of them, and they all change. And their hearts turn to follow God. So the story of Jonah's is a story about good news that people can change and become followers of God. And we celebrate that the Ninevites did that. But our friend Jonah still has a hard time. Our friend Jonah has a hard time loving and forgiving the people of Nineveh. And it's going to take some time for that to happen. But we're going to hear in our story that God doesn't give up on Jonah. God's going to stay with Jonah and hopefully, over time, Jonah's heart's going to change. So you know what, kids? Here's a great thing that you and I get to do. You and I get asked by God all the time to be his example in all that we do. And there might be some days that we just don't want to do it. And we go like this, nope, not going to do it, God, not going to do it. But guess what? Guess what? God doesn't turn away from us then. God actually stays right with us and is very patient because God is excited about the day that we will do what God wants us to do. God doesn't turn away. God loves us. Just like God loved the people of Nineveh. And just like God loved Jonah. So knowing that you're loved by God, friends. Don't you want to go out and tell others? Don't you want to go out so that others can experience God's love? That's what God asks us to do. It's really not all that hard, is it? All we got to do is wave and smile and say something good about one another. So kids, this week, go do that. Go be that voice of God, that presence of God for somebody else. And maybe, because of what you do, somebody will be changed, just like the Ninevites. Have a good week, kids. See you soon. Our scripture reading for this Sunday continues in the Old Testament. And today we move to the book of Jonah. And we're going to hear all but the second chapter of Jonah. We're going to hear from Jonah chapter 1, chapter 3, and chapter 4. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hole of the ship and had, and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God, the God will spare us, throughout, spare us a thought so that we do not perish. 
The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood for you. O Lord, O Lord, have done as has done as as it has pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows, but the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going, uh, uh, going into the city, going a day's walk. And then he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and every one great and small put on a sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, not shall they drink, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But then, when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which he did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a a night and perished in a night. 
And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as you heard in the text, you heard everything of the story of Noah except what Noah is most well known for, and that is the whale of a tale of Jonah being in the fish's belly. Well, I'm going to come back to that, okay? I want to come back to it after a while because I, I, I think we want to see that maybe with a different set of eyes. So let me give you a little background as we move into this. Where we're at now with God's people in the Old Testament, in the book of Jonah, we have Jonah as a prophet in the south. The northern kingdom of Israel has fallen. It no longer exists. It has been taken over by the Assyrians. The Ninevites, who we talk about, are Assyrian. They're outsiders. They're not people of Israel. They're not people of God. The Assyrians have basically been able to do whatever they want. You know, one of my favorite movies is the movie that's called uh, uh, about with Bill Murray, and, and he's in. He goes into the army. It's called Stripes, and and when they're in the army, they're they're in Germany, and and they're supposed to be protecting this important piece of equipment, but they've got some friends that they want to go see, so Bill Murray convinces the other guy in the movie convinces them that they should just get in that RV that they're protecting and go over and visit them. Well, while they're over there, something terrible happens to everybody in their company. They get captured by the Russians and they're in Czechoslovakia. So Bill Murray convinces everybody now that they can go and rescue their friends because going to Czechoslovakia is just like going to Wisconsin. You zip in, you zip out, nobody even knows you're there. Well, that's the way it's been for the Assyrians. The Assyrians have essentially moved into the northern kingdom like it, was, like it was Wisconsin. And now they're going down to Judea. And they view Judea just like Wisconsin too. They're going to zip right in, zip right out, take whatever they want. The only problem is, God is aware of what's going on. And God has appointed a prophet there named Jonah. And Jonah has preached hope and good news to the people of Judea. They have been hearing words that have given them hope and courage that God's going to take care of them. And up to this point, the Assyrians have not been able to penetrate in. However, they have been able to do a lot of damage. You see, the Assyrian king has put a bounty out on the heads of Judeans. As a matter of fact, the more Judeans that can be brought before the king, the more dead Judeans that can be brought before the king, the more, uh, the more of a bounty it would raise. So it wasn't easy being Judean, especially with the Assyrians. So when we first hear in the book of Jonah that God calls the prophet to go to the Ninevites, who are Assyrian. We maybe assume right away that the reason why Jonah doesn't want to go is justifiable. He's afraid to go to the Ninevites, to, to expose himself as a prophet from Judea with a bounty on their heads. Well, that's what we think right away. But it isn't until we get to chapter 4 of the book of Jonah that we discovered that Jonah's desire to flee has absolutely nothing to do with hatred, or to do with fear. It has everything to do with hatred. Jonah hates the Ninevites. Jonah has a dark spot on his heart for the people of Nineveh. He doesn't want to see them saved. In that fourth chapter, we hear Jonah say, I knew, I knew from the beginning, God, that if I went to Nineveh, you would do this very thing. And what was that very thing that God did? Forgave the Ninevites. Because the people of Nineveh's hearts were changed. Now, let's be clear. 
Jonah, as a prophet, is very reluctant to go to the people of Nineveh. Even after he spends some time in the whale and bargains with God, his message, his proclamation to the people of Nineveh is not a proclamation that is transformational. If left to Jonah, the people of Nineveh would perish. I want you to think of it this way. Instead of Jonah walking through the city with this loud, booming voice that's changing people, whoever hears it, Jonah's more plodding along like Eeyore in the cartoon. You better change. You're gonna die 40 days. That's Jonah's message. Not very powerful, is it? Not something that would make you quake wherever you were standing, right? So how is it that the people of Nineveh change? If the prophet is reluctant and has a hardened heart towards them, how in the world do 120,000 plus people of Nineveh, including the king, who don't know God, change and come to God? Because God speaks even through a reluctant prophet. While Jonah was being Eeyore through the city, God was beginning a message of transformation. As Eeyore Jonah spoke, the proclaiming God overdid it. The people of Nineveh heard God in the midst of the words of Jonah. And the words of God that they heard brought about an immediate transformation. Now, when we think about that, we can look at the book of Jonah and say, the book of Jonah is a book about redemption. It's a book about a group of people who are so filled with hatred, they change and they become part of God's community. And that is within the book of Jonah for the people of Nineveh. And I think we can look at Jonah that way. But really, I don't think that's the point. I don't think the book of Jonah is about the Ninevites at all. The book of Jonah isn't a book in which we celebrate 120 plus souls coming to God. The book of Jonah is about the heart of one man. Jonah. And as we read the book of Jonah, we come to an unfinished conclusion. The book of Jonah ends in chapter 4 with Jonah and God on a hillside. And Jonah's heart still filled with anger and resentment to the Ninevites. Here is a prophet who goes to this group of strangers, this group of haters, and his proclamation changes the lives of everyone. Shouldn't that warrant Jonah standing in the midst of the city of Nineveh and leading these people, his new sisters and brothers in the faith, leading them in a celebration? It sure would make sense, wouldn't it? If the story was about the redemption of the Ninevites. But I don't think that's what the story is about. The story has always been about Jonah. See, Jonah knew. Jonah knew exactly what God was all about. When Jonah got that message in chapter 1 to go to the Ninevites and to to proclaim a message that says you better change or God's going to destroy you, Jonah knew exactly what God was going to do do, because he says it in chapter 4. He knew God was slow to anger, full of mercy, and abounding in steadfast love. He knew that his going to the Ninevites was going to result in the Ninevites coming to God. And Jonah didn't have room in his heart to do that. It was far easier for Jonah to keep the divide, to keep the hatred, to keep the resentment. Jonah wanted to live in the darkness as opposed to the light. But God wanted more. And God won't give up on Jonah. 
when we hear about him in the ship and we hear about him getting tossed over, did you hear that though? Whose idea was it to throw Jonah in the water? It's Jonah. Jonah's hatred is so deep for the Assyrians and the Ninevites in particular that he's willing to die instead of going there and being part of changing their hearts. That's how rigid, that's how deep his resentment and hatred is. But God won't let it win. This is where the whale comes in. God does something miraculous. Jonah falls into the water in full hopes of drowning. God won't let it happen. God stays committed even with the reluctant ones. When, God, when Jonah is in the whale, he half-heartedly bargains with God. And God stays committed to, jo to Jonah. When he gets on the shore of Nineveh, Jonah reluctantly goes and does his job. Like I said, he plods along like Eeyore. But God won't let that half-hearted attempt stop the transformation. And when Jonah goes and sits outside the city, wanting to see it destroyed, because his hatred is so deep, God will go and sit patiently alongside foregoing the celebration of 120,000 plus new believers. Friends, the story of Jonah is the Old Testament account that we heard Jesus talk about when he talks about the shepherd who leaves the flock, leaves 99 who are safe and saved and goes to seek out the one who's lost. We could look at the book of Jonah and say, it doesn't give us a conclusion. I would argue it gives us the best of conclusions. A Jonah still filled with anger and resentment sits on the side of a hill, not alone, but with God. And God will patiently speak to his heart. God won't leave Jonah until Jonah can begin to see the people of Nineveh as his sisters and brothers. Friends, we've been living in the midst of great division. This story of Jonah works very well for us today, how we live today. Who don't you have room for? Who don't you have room to go and proclaim good news for? Find it in your heart to begin to make room again. Find it within you to recognize God at work. Find it within you to stand with God and say, let me go with you, God, now, and let me go and celebrate the coming together again of the ones who were once divided. This is God's desire. Not that his people are divided and separated and filled with hurt and resentment, it is God's desire that good news be proclaimed and that people see each other as sister and brother. May we begin that path. And if we're not ready yet, know this. God sits right next to you and will remain right next to you, whispering, ever so gently, the words that will slowly open your hearts so you can be the one who lives a much richer and fuller life as part of the whole, the united body. Amen.
love of the Lord we are called to be light for the kingdom, to live in the freedom of the city of God. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another. and blindness will be no more. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly with God. song sing of the great day when all will be one God will reign and we'll walk with each other as sisters and brothers united in love we are called to act with justice we are called love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly with God. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. As self-absorbed and evasive as Jonah was, you still used him to powerfully and effectively proclaim your word of grace. Likewise, use us to despise our flaws and resistance to your call for the fulfillment of your mission in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. In times of change or upheaval, we are tempted to withdraw and be concerned only for ourselves. Open us to our neighbors, especially those with whom we disagree, and encourage us to seek understanding across lines of beliefs and loyalties. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. The seas are once again crying out against the injustices which have been done to them. Empower all those working to clean the earth's oceans and prevent further loss and damage to your beautiful creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Self-absorption separates us from the healing blessings of community and mutual support. Help us each to reach out to those who, have, who are isolated or you and use Help us to reach out to those who have isolated themselves and use us to spread the Spirit's healing grace. Be especially this day with those whom we lift up. We pray for the sick in body, mind, or spirit, those dealing with COVID or experiencing medical tests or surgeries or treatments, those who are experiencing difficult times or financial stress. We pray for the homeless, the homebound, those who are hungry or lonely or helpless or grieving. And we pray for those on our FLC prayer list, as well as those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. 
Your departed saints have gone only from our sight, not really separate, uh, separated us in spirit. Keep us bound together in ties of love and bring us to that day when we will be reunited in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, our Father, who art, art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And, and lead us, us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, whose love in humble service bore the weight of human need, who upon the cross forsaken worked your mercy perfect deed. We, your servants, bring the worship not a voice alone, but heart consecrating to your purpose every gift which you impart. Still your children wander homeless, still the hungry cry for bread. Still the captives long for freedom, still in grief we mourn the dead. As you, Lord, in deep compassion, heal the sick and free the soul, by your Spirit send us power to our world to make it whole. As we worship, grant us vision till your love's revealing light in its height and depth and darkness dawns upon our quickened sight. Making known the needs and burdens, your compassion bids us bear, stirring us to ardent service, your abundant life to share. Call my worship to your service, Forth in your dear name we go To the child, the youth, the aged Love in loving deeds to show Hope and help, good will and comfort Counsel, aid and peace we give Let your servants Lord, in freedom, may your mercy know and live. And dear friends, remember that you are the church wherever you may be. So go in love and peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>